Welcome to the Web Basics HTML Part 1 topic lecture or topic video. We're going to get started with HTML here. What we're going to understand when we're done with this uh, video is uh, we're going to understand XML based markup languages in general, understand these things called tags and attributes, and see how a number of these look similar. Okay. We're going to understand HTML5's place in the web with respect to other HTMLs. Okay. We're going to understand the structure of an HTML document. We're going to know about learn and know and when to use two fundamental HTML attributes, class and ID, which we'll be using all the time throughout this course and if you're a web developer throughout your web development career. We're going to find out what belongs in the HTML head out element and we're going to learn about a bunch of basic text stuff okay and links and structuring documents structuring html documents which is a, a fairly new thing like in the last 10 years or so nice set of readings all these are linked so we use the slides okay that'll give you a nice introduction this is our textbook Markup languages, HTML. There are other versions of HTML out there. HTML4 being the first widely, widely deployed one. XHTML, which was a formalization of HTML of, that obeys all the XML rules. However, nowadays you only have to worry about HTML5, unless you're doing some work with legacy stuff, which you'd be doing as part of a job, where you'd be getting paid. So not in this class. Okay. What are these markup languages, this type of markup language, not marked down, not something like that. Okay. They consist of elements which can have contents. Okay. These elements are defined by tags. The elements can be nested, and the elements can have attributes. Okay, so other markup languages that I've used or use a lot still is Scalable Vector Graphics, SVG. This is the thing used on the web for tons of data visualization. You'll see these all your infographics off good newspaper sites uh, use uh, SVG graphics. And there's a, a library that's very popular, but... Uh, not necessarily easily to get started with, called D3, which creates wondrous uh, visualizations. I've used that extensively myself in my projects. Music XML is was designed from the ground up for sharing sheet music files. Okay, so I use that when some of the music programs I use. SVG. What does it look like? Okay, so we see these funny greater than and less than signs. We see a tag. We see things like kind of familiar, rectangle, circle, text, text, and stuff like that. Then within the rectangle, we see things like its width and height. Okay, so this is gonna be the tag. This is gonna be the attributes. Okay, we're gonna learn more about those in a sec. Okay, and that simple bit of code Will produce a nice graphics in a web browser. Music XML. How does it look similar? Well, once again, we see the funny less than greater than signs for each element, setting off each element. We'll see what's a tag, part list, score, etc., etc., key signature, time signature. This is all specific to music notation. Okay. And if you use an appropriate program, the visual representation of that music would look like this. But it also has enough information so that that music could be played back in forms. Okay, so it conveys more than just a graphical representation of this. Okay. So all these are kind of related to XML, the extensible markup language. Okay. It defines a set of rules for encoding documents in a format that's both human and machine readable. You get to define, okay, with XML in general, 
you get to define the elements. Okay, you come up with what you want the tags to be. Okay, what the content should be would be elements and the attributes. Okay, we're not going to be doing that with the HTML. Okay, we are given the set of tags, the attributes, permitted content, and a whole mess of things. However, we will get to do something like that when we create React components. It's going to look like we're coming up with our own language or set of that we use to describe the components in our project. So the idea of XML is with us. However, we're not going to be using XML directly. So what is HTML5 and where did it come from? It was first released back in 2008. It's been updated a bit. I, we're about to come out with HTML 5.3. Okay. It's not as rigid as XHTML. It remains backward compatible with older software, but it's got a lot of nice features okay, that we will be making use of. And it's got APIs and all sorts of good stuff. The only thing we have to worry about in this class. So it's really, really dry to read about and just hear somebody talk about this. So let's do something along with it. Here's an HTML5 document outline. This is minimalistic. Okay. So we're going to try this out. We're going to use this to try out various elements during this uh, video. So I'm going to copy that text. Okay. I'm going to go to a sample directory here. I'm going to, this is the tedious way to do this. Okay. I'm going to say practice HTML going to ask me if I want to change it. Yes, I do. Then I'm going to come over here and say, uh, let's use a nicer editor. Let's use brackets. Okay. We don't need to look at that stuff there. Then I'm going to cut and paste. Okay. This is what I mean by a nice text editor, uh, code editor. Okay. We're going to see syntax highlighting here. Okay. We're going to use this. Okay. We're going to use this basic outline. We haven't explained anything about it yet. Okay. We're going to use this to try out things. Okay. Let's see what happens if we double click on this. Brings up a page in the web browser and there's nothing in the page. No errors. Oh, we didn't put anything in the page. That's right. This is just a document outline. Okay. Wait a second. It says an empty. When I go hover here, or when I go over the tab, it says an empty HTML5 document. Where'd that come? Oh, that corresponds to this thing in the title. Oh, interesting. But there was nothing in the page. Oh, so the title doesn't show up there. Interesting. Hmm. Well, we're going to all learn about that. Okay, so let's get formal. So we're going to talk about elements. They're going to have an opening tag and usually a closing tag. There are some elements in HTML5 that don't have a closing tag. Okay, it's kind of weird, and this is where it breaks the pure XML paradigm. Don't worry about it. Your tools will help you figure out what those are. Okay. So we have an opening tag. We've got content. Okay. So the content is after the opening tag before the closing tag. The content is not inside the tag. Okay. We can nest elements. Okay, so I have here an opening tag for something called a section and a closing tag for section. But within it, I have this stuff, H1, whatever that is, we haven't learned about it yet. And we've got within section, then afterwards, we have something called P, Opening tag, closing tag, strong, strong, blah, blah, blah. Let's let's see what this does. Let's copy it. Go over to our handy dandy text editor. I'm going to put all these things for right now that we're trying out 
all the elements other than things that go in the head. There are certain things that go in the head, as we'll learn. I'm going to... Ooh, that's ugly. Oh. I have a hotkey that helps me automatically format. This thing has a beautifier in it. Okay, let's see if I see it on my list here. Beautify. Control Alt B. This is a code formatter. Okay, by using one of these code formatters, you can see if you've got your containment hierarchy wrong. Notice as things get nicely indented and such like that. Let's save it. Oh, the page didn't change. Oh, we need to reload the page to see it change. All about cats. My cat is very grumpy. We've got some content. Woohoo! Okay. So, the point of view is we have these elements, and elements can be nested. Okay. Opening tag, closing tag. Good editors will help remind you of that. Okay. What can you nest? Okay. The section 4 of the HTML standard contains price, precise definitions of the HTML elements and their content model of that standard describes what you can put in an element as content. Okay. Uh, instead of manually checking all those definitions, you can use a free validation service. Okay. What, is, uh, what do I mean by that? There's a validator thing, see? Validate by URL, validate by file upload, validate by direct input. Okay, let's see if our HTML that we've been working on is valid. Okay, so I'm going to copy. I did a control A and a control C, so I select it all. And most editors have something like that. Okay, I'm going to paste it over here. And I'm going to do a check. What does it say? Document. Checking completed. No errors or no warnings to show. Good. Ish. Okay. So we can easily get a free check whether our HTML is valid. Okay. So we talked about elements. Now we talked about the tag portion. Now an element can have attributes. Attributes are always of the form, a name, equal sign, double quotes, not single quotes. We're going to get into a little bit of difference here, because when we go to JavaScript, we're going to have three different types of ways of quoting things. Single quotes, double quotes, and back ticks. In HTML, attributes, the only thing you use is double quotes. So we have a name here. This happens to be class. Sorry. So we have our attributes of the form name equal double quote some attribute value. Okay. We're gonna there's gonna be two fundamental attributes that we use all the time. Okay. ID and class are attributes that we can assign to almost any HTML element, and definitely all the elements that would be visible or any element that would be within the body. Okay. Rules for this. An element can have only one or no ID. Okay. So it can have one or none. You can't have two IDs, and it must be unique within the entire HTML document. Okay, so let's see an example. H3, ID equals next big thing, a heading with an ID, P tag, just a paragraph, P, only one, paragraph with an ID. Let's see what this looks like. We're going to copy it, run over to our two run over to our sample practice file, add in some stuff, clean up this stuff. Let's take a look at this stuff. Oh, heading with an ID. So what were the rules I just said about IDs? They can have only one, 
and it must be unique. Let's see what happens if we break the rule. Here, this H3 has an ID, the next big thing, and this paragraph, we haven't learned what an H3 is or a paragraph is, is also has an ID, the next big thing. Let's see what happens. Doesn't complain at all. Jeez. Browser doesn't tell us anything. So, let's see what about the checker. Will the checker tell us anything? Okay. Put in the new thing. We've got multiple IDs. Let's hit check. Ooh, the checker found it. The checker found it right away. Duplicate ID, the next big thing. Why would that cause a problem? It turns out, if you want to navigate within a page, you use an ID. That means if you want to go to a particular part of a page, you want to link to another part of the page, you have a very long page and you would like to link to it so the user can get to that portion quickly, you use an ID. Hence, this is one of the reasons why unique must be unique within the entire HTML document. Not the entire website, but in within the entire web page. Okay, so IDs are very good for uniquely identifying things. We'll be using them from code to get to certain elements. We'll be using them to navigate to certain ele elements. If we did say make a, we have a long page and we want to make a table of contents. That when we click on an L, a piece of that table of contents, something in that, it'll take us straight to that item. Okay, IDs, key. Okay, we'll use them all the way through, and we'll use them with React. Class attribute. An element can have an arbitrary number of classes assigned to it. Okay, so here's a attribute. Class equals story, my story. So this guy gets a single class. To add multiple classes, use the following syntax. Class, story, space, lead. So each one of these gets, each one of these things separated by a space is a class name. Okay, so this paragraph will have class story and class lead, meaning it's part of a story and a lead paragraph. Okay. Classes like this are used extensively with CSS. And particularly, you will if you're going to use a particular CSS framework like Bootstrap or Foundation or Semantic UI or whatever, there's a ton out there, uh, you'll use a lot of classes to get the styling you'd like. Okay. IDs more when we set up things as the page layouts. Okay. Very important. Let's see how this works. So let's copy it. Paste it in right at the top. Clean things up a bit. So you see how often I like to reformat. So I've got the hotkeys in my fingers to do it. Okay. Let's uh, clean this up. Next big three thing, 17. So we don't get errors for that. We'll see if we did this class thing right. Okay. An empty HTML document. My story. Here's the lead paragraph. No errors or complaints here, but why would? We didn't see any errors before. Let's go check it with our checker. Now, uh, even fancier editors than this will actually help catch some of those errors via linting. Not necessarily. It's not necessary right now to use that fancy of an editor. Okay, I'm going to substitute in the stuff we had with the classes and do a check. And yes. No errors or warnings to show. That is a completely legit way to deal with classes. You will see later, later, and see when using CSS, particularly using somebody else's nicely designed framework, you will have not just one, but maybe up to 
to uh, maybe up to four classes you might assign to an element, depending on how fancy the styling is you're using. Okay, two key attributes. Very, very different. You can have multiple classes per element. Classes can be reused as many times as you like for different elements. IDs, you can an element can have only one ID or none, and it's got to be unique within the entire document. Very, very different. The HTML head. What is this thing for? Okay. First of all, we're going to tell you, always use a title element. This shows up partially in the document in the browser's tab. Fully shows up when hovering over a tab. Oh. So in the head, oh, that's right. Here's my head. I had a title. Okay. Let's see what happens if we delete it. Might as well. What could we hurt? I forgot to save. Hmm. It seems to remember the title. Okay. Let's see what happens if we take this. Go to our checker. Check. Ooh, it's going to complain. Error. Head is missing a required instance of the child element title. So title is required. Let's close that. And reopen it just to double check. Oh, see? Nothing up here. No errors. So, sounds like your browser isn't going to tell you very well if you've got errors. We're going to see how to see that better when we get into our browser development tools. Okay, browsers will help us. Okay, let's put that back. So, we have to have a title for our page. It doesn't show up in the page. It shows up in, like, the tab for the page. This is an example of what we call metadata. Metadata? Whose data? Metas. Oh, boy. He's talking to himself. Metadata. Okay, so like the title, other things we might put in the head, uh, and we'll see later uh, with the develop some of the development tools, particularly Mozilla and Firefox, uh, they get on your case if you don't include character set encoding. Okay, so this is the most standard used character set encoding for in the uh, web, UTF-8. And Unicode is a fascinating subject that we'll probably hit a little bit more later. Also, this is where information for search engines go. Things like a description, okay, standard thing that you should always put in for a page of any sort that's for commercial purposes, at least in description or con and content, okay, some of these tags, okay. Worrying about search, in, op, search engine optimization is outside our scope. You can go to Google and Facebook, and, or, and they will tell you all sorts of rules to optimize their stuff for your uh, pages, what they included, and so it'll get indexed better and such like that. Okay, What else do we can we put in the head? We don't have to. We can put in links to other files, including, like we're used to in other programming languages, we have imports, include, etc. Okay, we can bring in CSS files. We can bring in JavaScript files. Don't ask me why you use a link to bring in a CSS file and a script to bring in a JavaScript file. Okay, and then you use a link to bring in a favorite icon. Okay, but this is very common. You'll see a bunch of these in, within the head. Okay, So basically, the head is for metadata, data about your data, and for including stuff in that all-important title. Okay, 
There's some more things that will be put in there, none of which is required. You'll see some things that make things more mobile friendly concerning viewports and stuff like that, but no worries. We look those things up. Let's get started with actually getting some understanding some things. Okay, so let's introduce paragraphs. Okay, paragraphs. It's a block of text. Okay, there's only one flavor of paragraph. Okay, let's copy that over. Okay, let's get rid of all this other stuff because we don't need it now. Paste that paragraph. This could be a paragraph. Okay, we could even put in another version of it. This could be a paragraph. Okay, go take a look. Paragraphs. Okay, nice and simple. Okay. Headings. What do headings look like? And there's six types of them. Let's go see. Try them out. What is a heading? Okay. This is why we're doing it at this. Just got to try this stuff out. Otherwise, you fall asleep. Your fingers have to keep you awake. Ooh, I like my hot key to make this nice and neat. So, book, my first chapter in a section. Hmm. Gives us a bit of a clue. Remember, I have to read. Oh, it's those things. These are like headings for like books or chapters or sections or subsections or things like that. They're levels of introducing text or drawings, things coming up. Okay. So, they're headings. Okay. So use these okay to, before we have a bunch of paragraphs or other content okay and the highest level h1 is shown biggest must be the most the, it's the highest level in the hierarchy of headings okay so it has a bit of meaning it introduces a section of stuff okay headings and paragraphs Okay, now we talk about semantics. We'll talk about semantic HTML. It sounds so fancy and stuff. All it means is meaning. Huh? What does it mean? Meaning. Semantics. This thing is a heading. This thing is a paragraph. This thing is bold isn't really a meaning. That's a style. We're going to break up the meaning of things. We're going to use HTML to tell us the meaning of stuff. Okay. We're going to use CSS to do the styling. So understanding something's a heading is a lot more important in a certain sense than knowing it's bold. Okay. Heading means something to some to a screen reader. Bold. Mm, hard to say why it's bold. Okay. Are they emphasizing it? Are they making it strong? Those things sound like they have meaning. Bold is the style. Okay. We also want to structure our pages. Okay. So we have semantics, meaning meaning of like this is a paragraph, this is a heading, this is an article. We also want to structure things. We have navigation. We have menus. We've got captions and summaries and things like that. Okay. So meaning and structure in pages as opposed to the styling. Okay. So what do we mean by an unordered list? Okay. Unordered list. That means that things aren't necessarily, don't necessarily go care about the ordering. Okay. So we use for unordered lists, we say UL, the unordered list, and then each thing in the list is a list item, L-I. Unordered list, U-L, list item, U-I. And start tag, end tag. Let's check it out and see what it looks like rendered without any extra styling in the browser. Okay. Let's say unordered list. Paste, clean up, 
Uh, save it. Take a look. Oh, this is one of those things that are known as bullet lists that you'd see in all those PowerPoint presentations, right? Instead of one, two, three, four, it's just dots. Okay, so that doesn't mean indicate there's any order about these things. Okay, these are just a collection of things. Okay, these were like some of my uh, old uh, uh, Windsor boards. I forgot what I was looking at there. Okay, unordered lists. Sometimes steps matter. So you have ordered lists. There's some ordering to them. O-L, ordered lists. Oh, but an order list just contains list items. Okay, ordered list, L-O-L, list item, L-I. What does that look like? Copy, copy. Okay, so we have a structure and we have this meaning. Okay, it's an ordered list. H14. Notice how it had some auto completion there of putting in the ending tag. Ordered list example. Clean it up. Nice. Save it. Let's go take a look. Oh, so we do see things. These are sales in the order of sizing, obviously. This is 9.3 meters, 10 meters, 11 meters. These are sales for an old-fashioned type of windsurfing called formula windsurfing. Okay. And look, one, two, three, four. It's ordered. Now, I'm just going to take this. The styling of a list, how what we use, uh, oops. Oh, look at that. It's an ordered list, but if whether I go one, two, three, or A, B, C, that's a style thing. What I'm doing here is I'm using my development tools to go look at the order lists in the browser. Look, see, we can see that ordered list. We can see the list items in it. I went over here to my ordered list, and we'll be learning about styling soon. But the meaning of the list, it's an ordered list, However, we choose to style, uh, let's see. Upper Latin, Upper Roman. You can see, as I click through these options in this nice window, I can see Upper Latin, Upper Roman characters. All that is a matter of styling. The stylists have a choice there. But the meaning is still clear. It's an ordered list. Okay? Just like if we came over to the unordered list, you think we have something besides just circles? Yeah, you can put in other things rather than these bullets or these circles that are used there. Okay? So that's what we mean by meaning. Okay? Ordered lists have meaning. Okay? What else might we do? Is it okay to put lists within lists? Let's try it. Okay? H1 lists and lists. Paste, save, or clean up. Oh, see, we can see the structure. Here's an unordered list containing an item. Ooh, this is weird. Are we allowed to do this? I don't know. Let's see what the browser thinks. Uh, 
ordered list example, lists and lists. Oh, cool. Let's check. Oh, I'm suspicious. What? Can we put lists and lists? Here's an unordered list, a list item, another ordered list. Let's see. Let's take this guy. I'm going to go to the validity checker. You don't usually have to do this all the time, but this is an interesting case. So let's check it. Ooh. I get a red. Element OL is not allowed as a child of element UL in this context. OL can't be a child element of UL? So I can't have a list within a list? But it but it rendered it perfectly fine. It looks great. Might it always look great? I'm getting an error. Would it look good across all browsers? Not necessarily. Lists within lists. Nesting counter example. Not so obvious restriction. Let's go and look up UL and the HTML standard. UL element. Okay. Categories. Low content. Content model. What can you put in it? As we said before, is the content model. Here's this. This is from the standards. Okay, I didn't even go to MDM. This is straight from the dub, this HTML spec, and it says you can put zero or more LIs. You can't put an OL in it. <sighs> How could I have lists within lists then? And why did the browser just render it? Let's go look at the content model for LI. LI, the list item element. Okay, it can be used within OL, UL. Okay, it's flow content. Content model flow content. What does that mean? Oh, geez. Flow content is just about everything. You can put a nav in there. You can put divs in there. You can put paragraphs in there. You can put all sorts of stuff that we may not ever use in this class in there. Oh, so if I wanted to clean this up to pass the test, I would do the following. Li. Autocomplete sometimes isn't great. I'm going to take that, put it over here. I'm going to put this OL within an LI because an LI can contain anything. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay. So the only thing allowed in OLs and ULs are LIs. Okay. So is this going to be legit then? I don't know. It looks pretty bad. Oh, phew. <laughs> Do my auto formatter clean up? Okay. Now. UL just contains LI, LI. It's okay for the LI to contain the OL, another list. This, I think, is going to pass muster. Let's see if it looks similar to what we saw before in the browser. Refresh. Oh. It looks the same-ish, except for this dot here. This gets a dot because it's a list item. So it's not quite exactly what I would have liked, but not bad, not bad. Okay, so care is needed with lists within lists. Okay, let's go see what happens if we... Uh... Take this and check it out in our... Validity checker. Now, if you don't like the way that looks over there, what would we be supposed to clean it up with? We would clean it up with CSS. Okay. Document checking completed. No errors or warnings. Okay. So if we don't like the way things look, sometimes that's 
really, well, usually it's a matter of for styling. Okay. So we fix that content model. Then if we don't like the way it looks, we fix the styling. Now, we talked about bold and talked about italics. If we're going to say that and give the way to do that or say something similar, okay, to emphasize things, we might use italics to show it. That's generally what's used. We're going to use M for emphasis. Okay. A lot of times we use bold for important things, but instead of Tying that to the style, we're going to say strong. Okay. So let's go over here. This could be, let's put M here. Well, this could be a paragraph, and we'll put strong here. Strong. Notice I do a lot of cut and paste. Use, know your hotkeys. Make your life simple. We gotta, we're got we doing the programming. All right? No reason to make life harder on ourselves. Okay. So I put emphasis here, and it looks like it comes out looking italic. I put strong here, and it ends up looking like bold. How this is rendered, though, M, we have control over. If I wanted to, I could go and change the color to uh, purple. I didn't say that would be pretty or something. It's a styling issue. I could take away font, weight. I could make it bold. Ah, okay. So how you choose to show emphasis may be very dependent on the situation you're in. But I've said this is emphasis. I'm just calling this strong, you know, a different type of emphasis. And I can always then reflect that with styling of my choice. It would be nice to make it consistent, but you're allowed. So notice we're not using words like italic or bold or underline. Okay. We're going to do that kind of stuff through styling, like I just showed you. Okay. When we do markdown, and we do a star, star, around something, that gets translated to emphasis. When we do double star, thing, double star, that gets turned into strong. So it's not tied to a specific styling. The default styling is reasonable, of course. Okay. Now... We talked about content. We saw there they said this was flow content. Mm -hmm. In HTML, there's different models for content, okay, or different categories of content, okay. We're going to learn there's things like in. We're going to deal with things that are inline content and block content. The difference is, okay. And here's some examples. H1, the headings and paragraphs. Okay, and lists are block content. Okay, block content does not sit on the same line as other content. Okay, so here's an example paragraph, your paragraph, our paragraph. So we have three paragraphs on the same line of HTML. The question is, how will that show up? How will these three paragraphs show up when rendered? Because right? we said they're block content. Wait, these are all on the same line in the HTML, but paragraphs are block content. Oh, that's right. Paragraphs, we in old-fashioned days, we put an empty line between paragraphs to let us know it's paragraphs. Oh, when we put a paragraph tag, it gets says paragraphs are block content. Two paragraphs don't sit on the same line with each other okay so this is part of this type of content this will become important when we deal with styling because we'll deal with these different style contents and sometimes change 
what kind of content an element is. We may change something from block to inline, and there's some interesting things in between. That's all about styling. Okay. Links. What makes the web the web? A link. Okay. Here's paragraph. Oh, and inside the paragraph we see this A tag. It's got a hypertext reference, href, to, I just made that up. I don't know that href means hypertext reference. I'm assuming that's what it meant. I've never actually looked at the history. href, oh, pointing to the home page. Let's see what this is going to look like. Okay. That's why I do these things. Go see what it's going to look like. Put it right up to the top of the document. Okay, clean up the document. Okay, so here's a paragraph. Here's this link thing in the paragraph. href a. The a tag starts here. Okay. It's got an attribute href, which is a URL to a web page. Then it's got content. Okay, let's see how this gets rendered. Over here, I'm creating a link to the Mozilla homepage. I don't see, oh, I'm going to close this up. Let's make this a little easier to see by making it small. Where's the href showing up? When I hover over here, at the bottom of my browser, down here, you'll see the href that this is pointing to, the site this is pointing to. I click on the link, and I go to that site. Back button, go back to where I came from. Okay, let's go back to full screen. Basic link. you got to have the href. That's where you go to. Okay. It's always good to have a title to describe the link that you're going to. Let's see how this looks. So look, we've got the tag A, which I think used to stand for anchor. Okay, that's the starting. And so we've got the starting tag here. Now we have two attributes. href, which is the URL of, of the link, and a title. Let's see how the title shows up. Okay. Do the same thing again, blah, blah, blah. Put this above the other. Okay, clean it up. Save it. Go take a look. Blah, blah, blah. I'm creating a link to the Mozilla homepage. Looks just the same until I hover. And then I get a little pop up. The best place to find such and such. Hover on this one? Nothing. It doesn't have a title. Oopsies. Hover here, I get a title. Okay, nice. Links. Always, always good to give them a title, help explain to people where you're taking them. It's always good to check and keep an eye out for where that href is taking you. Look at the bottom of the page way down here and see where that href is taking you. Make sure it's not taking you someplace bad, right? We always do that with our emails to make sure we're not getting fished, right? Everybody does that, right? We're security conscious. Okay. You can have almost arbitrary whatever kind of content you want to be the link, okay? Notice here, within the A tag, and within the A, the link element, A, here's the beginning of the tag, here's the end of the tag, I can insert a whole paragraph. Let's try it, just to prove it to you. Do you usually use paragraphs? No, what you usually do is put an image there. So an image, clicking an image, okay, let's go clean it up. Let's, let's go crazy. Let's put, let's see if they'll let us do this. I've never tried this before. Let's put three paragraphs in there, okay? Save it over here. Ah, see, all these paragraphs, they all show up as part of the link. Ah. 
any of these. Not the stuff in between, but the paragraphs I can click on. Okay. Like I said, usually these images, one, the most common thing to do is use an image there, or you could put in, uh, what else? We could put in uh, a heading. Okay. One more thing. Oops, sorry. There's two more things. All right. Okay. We're going to deal with two types of URLs. Okay. Absolute URLs and relative URLs. An absolute URL has this HTTP stuff in it. Okay. HTTP, then the, whatever the domain name is, we'll learn about domain names and stuff later. Okay. That's an absolute URL. This is the protocol field here. Okay. The other type that we're going to use a lot in this class, and you'll use a lot in web pages in general, are relative URLs. Okay. They point to a location that is relative to the file that you're currently in. Okay. So I might go home HTML. I might have double double dot slash. What's that doing? That's going up a directory. Then we're going down into the CSS directory. Then we're going into the style CSS file. We're going to use these as much as possible. Why? Because this is how it's going to. We're going to deploy our websites easily from our laptop where we construct and build them over to the deployment servers that we want to use. Okay? We're going to use relative URLs as much as possible. Okay. The, sorry. Three things. How to deal with elements in the document. Okay. An element with an ID attribute can be linked to. Okay. So let me take this little sample. It's got an H2, foiling, all about foiling, blah, 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 blah. And we can link to it. So I'm going to copy that over. I'm going to put it way at the bottom. Why? So we have some place to go to. Okay, it's further okay, away. Now I'm going to come back here. I'm going to use, since we're staying within the same page, we can use either just, oh, hashtag. Hashtag foiling? Did you wonder where hashtag comes from, people? Yeah. It was always in the internet. It was always part of HTML for the longest time. So social media used, soul used the notion of the hashtag because that's what we used to identify stuff within pages. So that's where hashtags came from. It's really a, an ID link. Okay, so let's copy that. I'm going to put it way at the top. We'll be learning about these things. Let me get rid of some of this gobbledygook. cook. We don't need it there. Okay, so I put in a link at the top here. Let's go and take a look. Okay. Let's reload it. Now I say, see foiling. Where is foiling? Oh, foiling's way down there. So if I click here, Ah, it's going to bring foiling into view. If I make my browser even smaller, it's going to be even more helpful about bringing the item into view. Okay. So this is how we make tables of contents. Okay. And other links within pages. And we'll do other. We'll do other things. Uh, uh, using local uh, local page references or whatever you want to call them. Okay, so IDs, so we can navigate within a page easily. Okay, so this is an ID. To reference the ID, we use hashtag ID name. Okay, pound sign hashtag whatever you'd like to call it. Okay, if we're giving a more complete URL, you want to jump right into a page. Something on the page, you give the page name, and okay, this will be known as the fragment when we formally learn URLs, but don't worry about it now. It's just the ID, how we get to it, hashtag the ID name. We use that for the reference. 
one more thing. This has drove me crazy. Is how do you make sure you open up a uh, a tag, uh, a, open up the link in the new tab, right? You're giving people a bunch of informational links that they can click on, but you don't want them to necessarily leave your page. You'd like to open it in a new tab or a new window. Okay. The way you do this is yet another hidden, uh, yet another attribute, target equals underscore blank. Okay. Target, out, attribute. Okay. We have to have that. And this underscore blank is key. Where they came up with it, why they use that, lost to me. Okay. There's no way I would remember that except that I wanted to do that, so I looked it up. Okay, let's try it. One last thing. Open in a new tab. Okay. Uh, some URL. Let's go to grottonetworking.com. Something real. Okay, we said that my link, my link, good enough. Okay, let's see the behavior. Reload it. My link. Opened it in a new tab. I think that's getting pretty much there. So link summary. Okay, the tag you use for links is the A tag. Nice and short, easy to put in lots of links. You've got to use attributes. href is the URL of where you're trying to get to. Title, always helpful, mm -hmm. uh, but optional. Target, mm -hmm. I have only really used it for the case where I uh, want to open something up in a new tab. Okay. Lots more details and stuff. Mm -hmm. See the HTML link reference at MDM. Let's talk a little bit about structure. Websites can have headers, not to be confused with the head, right? Head, not header, is for metadata or headings, right? Those are different from, right? Okay. Navigation bars, sidebars, main content, footers, okay? These are all part of the design, the way people think about designing things, okay? Some of these are very important for be, for accessibility, meaning that not only I would I highly recommend this article. Okay, I don't know why they have the molten lava picture. Okay, we talked about we want to give things meaning. Okay, and so we'd like to understand the portions of a page. Okay. For example. Main content. There's a tag for main content. What's main? What's the unique content of the page? Separate from, say, a navigation menu, which will take you different parts of the site, <laughs> side content, or whatever. Main content will use for content unique to the page. That's what this page is about. Skip the other stuff, get me right to it. That's an idea. Articles. Enclose a block of related content that makes sense on its own without the rest of the page. For example, if you have a blog, a single blog post, or it could be something much shorter. It could be like a Pokemon card or a magic card or something like that. It's self-contained. Sections. I use these all the time. Similar to an article, but it's generally grouping a single part of something that's part of a bigger thing, right? So in, this came from technical papers where we break things up into sections, or legal documents where you break things up into sections. Sections could contain articles if they were standalone on their own, but typically an article would be broken up into sections. However, you can have sections without articles, articles without sections. Asides. Asides contains content not directly relevant to the main content, but can provide 
uh, additional information. So we're going to see something called a nav coming up. Navigation is usually for navigating the site, the website. A site is a good place to put navigation of the page that you're on, okay? Or side comments about things, okay? Headers, not head, but header, not H1, H2, H3, H4, represents a group of introductory content, okay? So you would put a bunch, can put a bunch of stuff together in a header. Okay. And even maybe going, well, sorry, we'll get to that. I'll hold that thought. Navigation. Navigation contains the main functionality for the page and pretty for the website. Okay. Secondary links okay. would not go in navigation, but probably would go into an aside. Okay. Screen readers will really pay attention to navs because this is how they show somebody who can't see or needs assistance how where to go to navigate around the site okay you can have tons of links all over the place but the things in the nav are their main way of navigating the website okay footers kind of like headers and content for a page okay Comment. You don't need to use all of these all the time. Many older websites don't use any of these. Most came with HTML5 and significantly helped with accessibility and code readability. In older websites, you will see instead a lot of divs. Okay. Or you'll see a combination. Okay. I'm gonna, you're going to have an exercise where I'm going to have you go in detail and read up about these and try and understand the difference between navs and main and where you should use one within the other, etc., etc. Let's take a look at an older website. My website. Why do I say it's older? Well, because it's been around for a while. So here we see body. Okay. It has a nav. The nav is this main bar up here. Okay. Okay, that's how you get around in general my site. Okay. But then you see something, just a div. Okay. It's given a class, container fluid. We learned about classes for styling purposes. Oh, look. Here, instead of using main, it's got div ID main content. Well, that's nice, but nowadays we have the main. Okay. It is using the footer class. Down here at the bottom, okay. I mean, sorry, the footer element, okay. So it's using a combination of the new things and still using some of these divvy things. What are these things? Divs? Wow. We call these non semantic wrappers, okay. Span is an inline non semantic wrapper, it doesn't start a new line okay block a div is a block level non-semantic element okay which no two divs will be on the same line as each other a div will be put underneath the next div why do i say they're non-semantic because it doesn't come with any meaning okay so this div you can use divs all over the place you saw here how you attach meaning to them is you give them an ID or you give them a class, okay? And these classes, this is how people would style. And you still do a bunch of styling when you're using frameworks such as uh, Bootstrap and things like that. I was using the Bootstrap framework here. Now I use a framework because I'm not a designer. Okay. Final comment, I already said that. We'll use those. You'll use those when you use the frame CSS framework. Okay, then there's some other things like breaking lines, horizontal rules. Notice that there's no end tag here. Okay, there's no, okay, simple thing. We'll see other techniques with borders and such like that. 
So welcome to HTML. Get hands-on with us. Okay, and we'll see you later.